Jay Dyer, thanks for coming on Men with Chess. Uh, really appreciate it. How you doing tonight? Doing well, doing well. Uh, busy, busy time. A lot of the debates going on, trying to organize a lot of stuff, trying to finish my second book. But I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm honored. Excellent. Yeah, I heard you have a, a big debate coming up tonight on Worski Live with an unnamed uh, big YouTuber. Is that right? Well, I haven't heard back yet from Andy. I heard from him a week ago, and he said he would try to get it arranged tonight. But I texted him today, and he hasn't responded yet, so I don't know. Oh, wow. It'll be tonight for sure, but it keeps getting postponed, so hopefully it'll happen eventually. Gotcha. All right. Well, I hope that goes through. I look forward to listening to it. Um, Me too, man. I'm excited to debate. <laughs> like <laughs> mega big atheist. And I think some people have already figured out who it is. It's not Stefan. It's not Sticks. It's not Jordan Peterson. So that only leaves a handful of other. Well, I was kind of hoping you were going to do a seance and debate Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he, I don't think I'm not trying to be offensive to this person, but I, I don't think he's he's not really known as being a uh, an intellectual atheist. He's more of just a vocal kind of a flamboyant uh, atheist, more so than a uh, like a PhD or something. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I look forward to it. I heard your debate with uh, Nicholas Fuentes, and I, I thought that was very entertaining and. Um, so I, I respect your debate skills, that's for sure. Well, thank you. I've yet to lose a debate, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, for those of you who don't know, Jay Dyer's uh, website is jaysanalysis.com. Uh, he's the author of Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film. Um, uh, Jay, what else do you want us to know about you? Yeah, I am the... Uh, I run... Jay's analysis, as you said, but I also do a subscription service there. That's kind of the main means of how people interact with my work is through the articles and the videos and subscribing to uh, educational content, basically. So there's a lot of lectures on philosophy, history, theology, uh, geopolitics, book reviews. uh, And I've been doing that for, I guess, about a year and a half or two years now. So that's one way to access my material and I also am the co-creator and co-presenter of the television show Hollywood Decoded uh, on Gaia TV which is accessible through Xfinity and Amazon Prime and all that stuff. Oh awesome. Yeah I watched that episode uh, you sent to me on Lord of the Rings. It's fascinating stuff. I thought that was really great. Kind of a a, a cult or symbolic Siskel and Ebert I guess you could say. Yeah, yeah, we try to say Siskel and Ebert uh, on acid or Siskel and Ebert 2.0 or, <laughs> yeah, different ways to kind of update Siskel and Ebert. But thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. Well, good stuff, man. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, we wanted to talk tonight about social engineering. Uh, I've heard you talk about this competently in the past on Tim Kelly's show and other places and um, Specifically, how it's affected Christianity in the West in the 20th century, but also more broadly. So, uh, I think uh, hating on baby boomers is kind of a, a popular meme right now, and there seems to be kind of something wrong with them. They're very self-indulgent people, and they kind of you know wasted away our economy and all these different criticisms we have. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of that has to do with the social engineering that's gone on. So, can you give us kind of a Big picture, uh, where is this coming from and why is it being done? Yes, and I have to take some credit for that because my friend Mark and I were writing uh, blog pieces about eight years ago uh, making boomer jokes. So I might, <laughs> me and Mark might actually be the, <laughs> the first uh, internet uh, boomer posters. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, it's obviously it's not anything as naive as to say that the problems of the world are the result of a single generation. Um, we have to look, I would say, at many years of practicing and perfecting the technique of social engineering. So in a, in a very broad sense, this is uh, the practice that goes all the way back to Machiavelli, or you could extend it back even to ancient empires. And you even see this kind of stuff in the Bible. You'll see the means and methods of geopolitical machination when you read the books of the Kings, Chronicles, Samuel, etc., but in the modern era, era, it's a little more precise because you have the rise of uh, technological process, techne, and, and scientific technique in how to manage mass uh, groups of people. Mm-hmm. So you 
I would argue that most of this arises out of the military and wartime strategies and planning. Uh, certainly prior to that, you had bankers who were already back in the um, 1700s, 1800s, the times of the revolutions. They had already noticed how to fund revolutionary movements in other countries. Uh, this is not solely the enterprise of Jewish bankers. It is a practice of bankers in general. And you can read that uh, Carol Quigley, I have lectures on the totality of his book, Tragedy and Hope. And he covers the, he uses France as one example, and he covers the Rothschild, the Catholic, and the Protestant interests that all were sort of vying for power and control of France as, as one test case. Uh, now, certainly over time, uh, Jewish banking interests tended to have a lot of power through the Rothschilds, but we can't leave out our WASP and our uh, Vatican bank connections either. And of course, the, the Rothschilds have also been uh, the uh, official papal bankers, I think, since the 1700s. So, so all of these interests in, interconnect. And uh, as I think Spangler put it very well, there's never been a socialist revolution that wasn't funded by capitalists at the top. Uh, <laughs> and I think that that's accurate. And so uh, when we look at the French Revolution, we see a kind of a, a combination of uh, Protestant, Swiss, and Jewish banking interests and the British Empire having a vested interest in removing a Catholic monarch. We mm -hmm. see a similar pattern with the, uh, the funding of the Bolshevik revolutions from, from revolution, excuse me, from the Warburgs and, uh, uh, other New York banking houses. Uh, and that was essentially to reconstruct and set up a social experiment in Russia, uh, to get rid of the idea of uh, a czar, an imperium, and a confessional state. So you see the same pattern of the removal of the Holy Roman Empire uh, in Europe and the removal of the uh, Byzantine continuation in the Romanovs, mm -hmm. their removal by the Bolsheviks. And ultimately, this, I would say, is at the behest of the money power. It was the banking interest behind uh, both of these things. Uh, Quigley comes to the same conclusion that Friedman of Stratfor came to when they both said that the 20th century was about the Atlanticist or Western power blocks removal of their two main rivals, namely uh, Germany, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Russia. Mm -hmm. So that's the 20th century in, in total uh, in both of the wars and the Cold War. But what you get out of these wars and the wartime experience is a lot of research, research and development that goes into the war machine and perfecting the techniques of war. Uh, Quigley, for example, was a maritime war historian, so he also has other works about histories of civilization and warfare and so forth like that. Um, hold on a second. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, this research and development was focused largely in the traditional sense of psychological warfare, but also in the implementation of new techniques and strategies that would involve a lot of um, advanced uh, things like cybernetics. This would this would come to dominate uh, entities like DARPA, which would be very instrumental in um, how to manipulate technology to achieve the upper hand in warfare, specifically things like mimicking nature, transhumanism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but specific entities that can definitely be pointed to would be the, the Tavistock Institute, mm -hmm. uh, the Frankfurt School, uh, the, um, the, the, which, by the way, both had intimate connections to the CIA, the OSS. And as I was discussing Habermas in one of my lectures last night for subscribers, Habermas is one of the premier figures of the uh, Frankfurt School, which was the uh, German uh, Jewish figures who had studied culture and the idea of culture critique, culture creation, and ultimately culture degradation. Uh, and so Habermas, for example, talks about how you could socially engineer America uh, through all of these different cultural means. And what most people don't know, however, is that it was the OSS, the CIA, the Rockefellers, and Macy Foundation money that actually brought these Eastern Bloc Marxists over to help America fight the great wars. So what you get in America is a, basically they mastered the art of 
culture, cr- culture creation hmm. and toxic culture. And so it's not just Jewish interests. It was Rockefellers and the CIA that brought the Frankfurt School people over. So there was a combination of interests there. Uh, it wasn't just one group. Uh, yeah. They both had a, they both had a vested interest. And so that's how we get the 60s counterculture and the boomers is from these, uh, I would say, Pentagon, military, CIA, uh, Frankfurt School characters are all on the same team. Yeah, there does seem to be a real tendency these days on the internet among um, alt-rightish type communities to point the finger at Jewish interests and ignore some of the other interests. But there definitely was uh, a lot of different groups working together for the same goal. But I, I'm kind of curious, is there a unifying ideology for this agenda or is it just about amassing power and money or what, what have you found out? Well, I think that people who don't have a a theology or a belief in the transcendent, they're generally uh, walking around in a hall of mirrors trying to figure out who the one bad guy is. Um, But if you have a conception of of theology and a belief in the Bible, things like this, then you tend to have an overriding view uh, of history in total, beginning, middle, and end, and so you have a conception of uh, good and evil. Mm -hmm. And so good and evil are, of course, spiritual uh, forces, and they are not uh, any specific uh, racial, ethnic, uh, socio-political group, or class, that's not class warfare, it's not any of that. Uh, There are undoubtedly powerful interests, uh, but I see the Rockefellers as far more powerful and influential and prominent uh, in the last century than Jewish interests. For example, I mean, the, the Frankfurt School would not have had any power had, the, had they not been over by, been brought over by the, the by British intelligence and the CIA and the Rockefellers. Indeed. Yeah, I heard, heard you talk about on other shows how uh, in America and to some degree in Europe, the right wing tends to always point the finger at Marxism and communism. And this is the reason our civilization has been undermined and gender identity destroyed and pornography yeah. pushed on us is because some sort of KGB psyop or something. But uh, in, rea- in reality, when you look at it, it really seems like this is coming from, as you said, the big banks because they really funded these revolutions and the Rockefeller interest also pushed these things here at home. So really, the uh, well, there's a lot more to it than just commies, right? Absolutely. This is very crucial and this is one of the main reasons why I did the eight lectures on tragedy and hope is because Carol Quigley, who himself was a Catholic of sorts or professing Catholic of some kind, uh, was very much a fan of the Western Atlanticist democratic order. Uh, and he actually thought that, you know, this democratic new world order uh, would be the best thing for the world. So that's why he was uh, a true believer and a supporter, I believe. Um, and Quigley is very adamant in the book. This is probably what the book is most known for is the quotes where he says that the, the communist Marxist leftist socialist movements in America on their own had absolutely no power and didn't, weren't that effect, effective until they received all of this money from these very wealthy elites that were both Jewish, Protestant, and at times even Catholic. Hmm. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it might be difficult for some people to wrap their head around that, but I mean, it's like I said earlier that, that this is why you have the, the Wall Street funding both Nazis and the Bolsheviks. And one of the best ways to see this is to read some of the, the real inner circle planners of this, of this whole system, this overriding ideology that you asked about. Yes. Right. Uh, I've been doing a, a, series called globalist books and this is characters like people from the cia like miles copeland uh, or uh, people from the royal society like uh, bertrand russell the fabian society uh, people like hg wells and they are very uh, people like uh, charles galton darwin uh, arthur kessler i'll be doing jacques atali next these are characters who are, are very open about the overriding ide- ideology and it's not um solely racial it is also um, materialistic, it is technocratic mm-hmm. and uh, dysgenic. And so that's what Bertrand Russell says. Russell says, yes, I'm very happy to see the Bolsheviks succeed in Russia uh, because he says it's a social experiment just like all the other 
20th century um, movements and ideas. He says they're social experiments to see which things work best for for the technocracy. So the uh, the end game here is the development of this uh, new world order type technocracy, I guess is what you could say. Um, it almost to me looking at it seems like kind of a like a dark alchemy or something like a social alchemy. They're melting mm-hmm. down all these social institutions that we've had in the West for centuries and trying to create a, an entirely new society that's almost uh, a uh, an opposite image of what was there before out of what they've melted down. You know what I mean? Uh, is yeah, there... I think Go ahead. Yeah. I think you're spot on. There is a chapter in Tragedy and Hope that a lot of people miss because everybody focuses on the sections where he talks about the bankers funding the communists. There's a more important chapter about the rise of the military industrial complex. And Quigley's whole point in that chapter is that the new world order is transhumanism. It is technocracy. He says that's the whole goal of all of it. So we can argue about all these other things, and I'm not saying you can't argue about those other things. I'm saying that the long-term plan uh, is not just Israeli. Uh, it's it includes uh, the Saudis. It includes you know China. It includes all these other interests to be a part of this global scheme. And you can debate to what degree uh, you know atheistic Zionists or whatever have a role in that, but. Uh, I think that the the overarching plan is technocracy. It's not rooted in any kind of Jewish messianic uh, claims. You know, do you see what I'm saying? Yes, yes. I, I don't think that Bill Gates, David Rockefeller, and these these people who have, you know, arguably some of the they're probably some of the most powerful men on the planet. I don't think they're really concerned about Jewish messi- messianism. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they care about Palestine. Um, right. So what what do they care about? Technocracy. And so I, I see the, the, the most powerful people all being on board with that. And that's why to be in that kind of club, you, you have to be on board with that. You, you, they don't really care about the ideology of a single you know piece of land in the Middle East. I'm not saying that 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 Israel doesn't have a role in that. But if you look at when Israel is being set up, uh, what the, the Balfour declaration and the Royal society and all this, what they were saying at that time, uh, they weren't really concerned with Jews or Arabs. They just wanted an outpost. Uh, and the Royal society who set that up were just as interested in controlling, uh, the Islamic world, uh, as they were at controlling the, the Jewish uh, homeland, hmm. and and this, he, this is why this is why, by the way, Jews got mad at uh, British occupation, and you had like the Irgun and the the bombing of the King David Hotel and, and so forth. Right, um, and they do seem to have these technocrats, uh, an apocalyptic prophet in Ray Kurzweil, and he published that mm-hmm, book, mm-hmm. Uh, with, uh, over a decade ago, talking about the year twenty forty five and how human beings will become just totally integrated with computer technology and AI and the planet earth will basically become like a technological God being, you know? Uh, Mm -hmm. But I don't think that this is the plan for all seven and a half billion people. I I think the uh, becoming transcendent technological God beings is for the upper class and the rest of us will, well, I'm not sure what they have planned for the rest of us. Do you have any ideas? Uh, well, yeah, they say very clearly to get rid of everybody else. Um, so there's no debate about that. Um, that's been that when you read all of these globalist texts and these are formative thinkers for the, the global plan, um, they always talk about two or three things across the board. They, they never disagree about Darwinian evolution and technocracy. They never disagree about the need, the crisis to kill off most of the planet. And they never disagree about the implementation of a federation of all nations into a global government. Every one of them always across the board. That's their dogma. Hmm. So um, a one example, another good example is somebody like Arthur Kessler. Now, a lot of people would say, well, see, Arthur Kessler in 13th Tribe proves the Khazarian theory. Well, I don't really put a lot of stock in the Khazar theory. I think it's kind of a, a silly thing, but. What's interesting about Kessler himself is that 
he stepped out of caring about Jewish interests and was self-consciously a Luciferian. And he was p- part of that inner British Royal Society clique. And he wrote Ghost in the Machine. And at the end of Ghost in the Machine, he says what you just said. He says, it is a dark alchemy, what we're doing to the globe. Uh, and it is to, to, he puts the way he states it is, is to commandeer engineer, uh, to commandeer evolution to propel the species to godhood, basically, is the whole point. So they're all agreed on transhumanism. That's who came up with all this. The, the Huxleys, you know, coined the term transhumanism. Um, that is the, the ultimate goal. And that's also why you see a convergence of people, somebody like Ray Kurzweil, who I would assume has some kind of Jewish background, uh, and David Rockefeller. Hmm. Right? They, they both like the idea of transhumanism because it's a, it's an alternate version of the gospel, right? Salvation through technology. And so you could look at it like, who's the bad guy? Well, in the first century, who was the bad guy? Well, you had the Pharisees, they teamed up with Caesar and Herod. Yeah. So there's a combination of interests that are in rebellion against truth, against Christ, against the Logos. Right. Uh, and I don't believe that they actually will achieve technological godhood. I think that is, that's partly a, a, a lie, a myth that they are projecting. Um, and certainly there will be technological enhancements, probably extended life, longevity. Um, you know, I'm sure there will be all kinds of new miraculous nanotech health discoveries, but to think that this is going to give you immortality, I think would just be utter stupidity and, and being completely naive. Yeah, no, I totally why would the people, why would the people who say that they want you dead give you immortality? It's utter stupid. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I definitely think it's an overreach. That whole uh, can, what what is it called? The Ray Kurzweil theory? I forget, but I, I don't think it'll get that far to a, a technological godhood. But you know, all this technology singularity. Out, yes, yes, uh, I I think it's a positive thing in and of itself, and we just need to uh, reconvert sure. the culture and baptize it. Exactly. I was, uh, I forget which talk or stream or something, but I was saying that we have the template, you know, already laid down as to how to, um, build societies, how to build cultures, uh, and how to have real progress. And I, I, one of the things that I always cut at the root of is that, uh, most Jews and most alt right and most, uh, atheists and most pagans, uh, can you think of one thing they all have in common? Um, no. Not off the Darwinism. top of my head. What was that? Darwinism. Darwinism. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm a big opponent of Darwinism and have been for a long time. I'm always trying to find somebody to debate it. Yeah. Um, and I've written, a, I've written a whole ton of articles uh, against Darwinism and Darwinism factors directly into transhumanism. Darwinism, I believe, is a from, I come at it from the position of a philosopher. That's my training. And so I critique it uh, from a philosophical standpoint, which is not to say that I never, I don't ever engage in the scientific discourse. I do, but I'm mainly concerned with higher order questions and philosophy is a little bit higher order than empirical science. So uh, I believe that Darwinism uh, is a mythology that mm-hmm. arri- that originally comes from ancient Hinduism. And so the the if people want to make a connection between like scientism and uh, Kabbalism. Yeah, you can find that connection uh, because ultimately these these positions uh, are really the same as like ancient uh, pr- uh, perennial tradition style Hindu stuff. So you were once a rock and then you, you know, you, you or you were once a, a goo and then you evolved <laughs> into, you know, to something else. And so the transmutation of species. I think, which is completely ridiculous, is really uh, a, a very powerful presupposition that most people aren't willing to to criticize or question. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, why I think the the alt right is doomed to fail, um, as well as all these movements, because they're all predicated on uh, a, a false grand mythology, which is basically, you know, if you read the ancient Greek myths, it's the same idea. It's like lightning, the gods struck. Uh, 
the ground with lightning and, you know, out of it comes man. I mean, that's like exactly what the theory of <laughs> the protos, the protos, the rise of the protozoa was. So, so you're telling me, Jay, that you don't believe that every, all the complexity of life evolved from a single cell organism? You don't think this is a scientific fact? No, because uh, as I understand, uh, DNA uh, only prints what it has within that species code. So a whale is never going to print bear code. Right? A tree is never going to print whale code. Uh, you can have mutations and adaptations, but the new coding that is expressed uh, to ex- to show those mutations or adaptations is only what is already present in the strand, uh, and it's either on or off. Hmm. So th- the whale never has bear code. Well, I tend to agree with you. I've been skeptical of evolution and Darwinism my entire adult life, uh, being raised in a very conservative evangelical home that's sort of par for the course. But um, it's really when you look at it and take yourself out of the conditioning we've been put through, the social engineering we've been talking about, it's such an absurd theory, and there's no way you could empirically prove it. You'd have to go back in time billions of years and then observe the species evolving and have right. some sort of billions of years of immortality to even prove that it happens. So it's it's just an absurd thing on its face. And it's funny because of the reaction you get when you say you don't believe it. They treat you like you're the absurd person. So it's classic projection, I'd say. Right. And this is, there's many reasons for this. But most people who, for example, go to university and study biology or they study astronomy, and when I was doing my undergrad, I mean, I had to take science classes. I took a lot of philosophy science classes. I interacted with all of these different professors and and people with, you know, getting a biochemistry degree or whatever. So I, I, I did this for many years, and then I did grad school. I, I'm not unfamiliar with what is taught and how people defend their positions. And what I did when I was in my undergrad was actually pretty consistently debate professors. Um, that didn't make me very popular with the professors, but, uh, I did it and it is what it is. And, um, so for most of the, the science professors that I had, uh, for example, there was one guy who was an astronomy teacher and I had a debate with him and he actually suggested that I debate the head of the department. So I went to the head of I can't remember. He might have been the physics head. It might have been a different guy, but um, I think he was a physics guy. So I had a long, long, long debate with the head of the physics department. And what we, what I came to realize, this is, I was like 23 at the time, so I wasn't super versed in everything, but I did understand basic apologetics and I understood basic presuppositional apologetics at the time. So I, I was fairly well armed. And I realized that that education is compartmentalized and the people who study physics, Mm -hmm. they don't know philosophy. That doesn't mean that every person who studies studies physics doesn't know philosophy, Mm -hmm. but, but on the whole, um, it's very compartmentalized. If you are getting a PhD in physics, you might've only had one or two philosophy classes. I mean, it's not required. You might've had logic and you maybe if you wanted to, you might've taken something like, uh, you know, philosophy 101 or something. So most of them don't study a whole other discipline called philosophy of science, which is very famous, has a lot of uh, great intellectual giants who've written on the topics, people like Michael Polanyi. Um, and he's a famous scholar who has critiqued the positivist empiricist uh, tradition of, uh, of the physical sciences and, and philosophy of science, which is a dead end. Um, but you will be very hard pressed to find many people who get quote, hard science degrees uh, who don't grasp this. Now, this is another interesting point that should be made is that there's a distinct, I believe there's a dis- distinction between life sciences and hard sciences. Okay. And so things like biology, I'm not saying that they can't involve aspects of hard science, but when they start talking about the theory of origins, it's very speculative. Okay. If you're an engineer, which is part of science, engineering is science, computer science, mathematics, right? you're engaging in something that's more, I would say, directly directly relevant to something like understanding DNA Mm -hmm. because you understand design and you understand architecture, right? And so 
a lot of times when propagandists for Darwinism start talking about science is all on our side, science is all on our side, that's not actually true because there are plenty of engineers uh, who are theists and who recognize all of these same principles, and they're part of science. So it's just kind of a game they play where they kind of move the markers around and the bent, they move the 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 delineators around to decide who's part of science and who isn't, and it's all relative depending on the debate at hand. So, um, so they just don't know what they're talking about. I mean, I, I rambled there for like five minutes. <laughs> forgive me. No, that's fine. But, but the, at the end of the day, they don't know the basic philosophical questions like, you know, what about the principle of induction? Uh, you know, you ask most philosophers and I mean, scientists, unless they've studied a little philosophy, they're, they're kind of like, what? Yeah. Uh, what, what about this idea of why is the, do you believe the future will be like the past? Oh, well, that's just kind of a basic assumption. I mean, we don't, we don't worry with those questions anymore. So they just, they'll arbitrarily kind of just throw out the things that they don't consider relevant. But there's no uh, clear scientific test for what things are objectively relevant or not. It's their subjective taste. And this is why you have people like Neil deGrasse Tyson will say, a philosophy and philosophy of science don't matter anymore. Well, they don't matter because he can't answer those questions and he gets mad when people ask them. Right. Yeah, I've noticed that, especially in the new atheist community, there was a, a, a big attack on philosophy in general, classic philosophy, yes. because right. they were bad at it, <laughs> basically. Right. All they do is, you know, it's funny, they will criticize theists, and I will give them some credit because a lot of theists make bad arguments, and they rehash bad classical proofs for God, which I don't think are very good. I think they and need to be kind of restated because the... The questions and needs of our time are not the same questions and needs of, you know, the year 1300. Hmm. So, um, so they'll, they'll throw this, this monkey poo at the theists, uh, quite often and say how bad their arguments are and that they just rehash old debunked arguments. But guess what? All these new atheists are just rehashing people like David Hume and, uh, people from the French Revolution. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, they're not, they're not doing anything spectacular either, but rehashing, you know, enlightenment era arguments. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that the discourse is pretty low level and pretty, pretty lame and pretty weak. And it's kind of that way by design. I mean, a lot of these people are really just kind of pop figures propped up like Bill Nye. Um, oh, yeah. And, you know, Bill Nye's changed. Bill Nye's been caught contradicting himself multiple times. Somebody put together a great video of uh, Richard Dawkins totally contradicting himself within a few years about junk DNA, where he's like, junk DNA proves evolution. And then like a few years later, when suddenly they've decided maybe there's not junk DNA, he's like, I've never said junk DNA proves evolution. Junk, uh, the fact that there's no junk DNA uh, proves evolution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, these guys are definitely propped up in one way or another. I mean... For the public consciousness, science is not, you know, the scientific method and empiricism. It's it's just a way to drive the narrative in a certain direction in favor of Darwinism, in favor of transgenderism, all right. these social issues. It's just another form of social engineering. So Absolutely. that's why you have all these scandals at the different scientific uh, journals. People will uh, contribute studies that have bad evidence in it specifically to see if it can get published and it does because it supports a certain political narrative they want to push yeah there's a whole bunch of articles that you can pull up about fraud in science fraud in the peer review process there's no actual peer review way to prove the peer review process <laughs> i'm serious yeah. and there have been there have been countless mainstream articles on this uh, the most famous of which people can look up is the uh lancet arnold uh, the lancet journal which i've sourced this so many times I need to just archive this on my website, actually, but uh, everybody should read the very brief brief discussion from The Lancet uh, about where they were discussing about 50% uh, of most peer-reviewed papers are uh, fake. Oh, wow. Yeah, and The Lancet is, of course, Oxford's premier longest-running medical science journal. Hmm. That's insane. And that was, yeah, that was published, I think, two years ago. And you can still pull it up. The PDF of the actual file is still available, as at least it was fairly recently. So, uh, and this is not anything surprising or new. Now, people will hear this and they'll say, Oh, you're a science denier. Not at all. I mean, I, in fact, as I said, 
you know, a lot of my graduate work was philosophy of science, was phenomenology, mm -hmm. uh, was the questions of uh, analytics and how analytical philosophy ties into, uh, you know, the, the hard realities of the here and the now, right? This is kind of ancient philosophical questions just rehashed in modernity. So uh, I'm very pro-science. I think science is a wonderful tool for understanding the natural world. And anybody who would deny that is a complete idiot. But uh, science as a tool is uh, a giant light year leap from scientism, which is a grand narrative explanation. Yeah. But no tool can ever be a grand narrative. Right? If you have a monkey wrench uh, and a giant, uh, you know, if you have a monkey wrench, the monkey wrench doesn't tell you how uh, a, a car is built, right? I mean, right. A, wrench, a wrench is a tool. It doesn't give you an explanation. So in the same way, the scientific method is a tool for understanding the natural world, but by its very nature, it's not designed to ask questions that, by definition, would come uh, outside the scope of empirical investigation. So, for example, mathematical concepts, log logical laws, uh, these, by definition, are abstract and so they are not material. So when the so-called scientist or scientism proponent propaganda says, I don't believe in anything uh, immaterial abstract that I can't see, uh, he's not being honest because he will absolutely utilize mathematical concepts, principles, ideas like law, ideas like rights, uh, and those cannot be empirically dem dem demonstrated or proven. Very good. Well, let's uh, shift topic back to the, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the baby boomers and kind of what specifically was done to them as a part of this social engineering agenda. Um, mm -hmm. You're probably familiar with Terrence McKenna, definitely a spook mouthpiece, uh, well, maybe definitely, uh, talking about the archaic revival during his career. Um, it kind of seems like there was an agenda to dismantle the industrialized uh civilization that had been created in america and kind of get people to go back to the land and start living in like small huts and communes and kind of go back to an almost feudal lifestyle uh would you agree with that or i would absolutely agree with that and um i just put up a documentary on my website called the net which is about mk ultra and the unabomber and the rise of the internet and this is an old somewhat famous documentary from, I think, 2000, 2003, somewhere in there. Uh, and this is a, an interview with a lot of people who were formative in the rise of the Internet. And this is, you know, people at DARPA, people at MIT, military Pentagon level people. Um, and they are discussing the simultaneous rise of the, the concept of the Internet in the 60s with the Cultural Revolution. And so what I'm getting at is that you, all, you the, the deeper that you dive into this question, when you read the works of Dave McGowan, you find out that absolutely the the counterculture, and this would include the archaic revival, uh, primitivism, and and this idea, but, but you know, all the hippie ideas, and Terrence McKenna, obviously, um, as part of that giant social engineering project. And I don't think there's any question about that anymore, the deeper that you dive into it. A lot of people, boomers especially, have, have not heard this or not familiar with it. Uh, and so they kind of saw themselves as, you know, positioned in this period of Cold War uh, where Russians are all the bad guys and it's, you know, the evil empire. And the only way out of that is to make sure that Americanism and uh, Pepsi and Coke can be mm -hmm. spread to the whole world, right? And simultaneously, with that is what you're saying. The deindustrialization is absolutely aided by the rise of the hippie culture. And the same people at the Royal Society who back in the 30s were talking about the deindustrialization of the West and the rise of China as an industrial uh, powerhouse for the globe. Oh, wow. They were also the people who were saying we can socially engineer the West with giant LSD, mushroom, Terrence McKenna, Timothy Leary, Stooges. Well, and this was back in the 30s. Right. So in the 30s, you have uh, Russell saying, and I did two talks on Bertrand Russell's books, uh, Scientific Outlook and uh, Impact of Science on Society. And in both of those books, he discusses um, the the geopolitical plans and how the West will 
uh, attempt to be destroyed and deindustrialized and the rise of the East. Hmm. Uh, and he even mentions things like uh, mass weaponized migration. Oh, wow. And this, at the same time, another one of his uh, cohorts in this conspiracy, Aldous Huxley, was instrumental in Tavistock and uh, uh, the British version of the the rise of LSD, Sandoz Pharmaceuticals. And that's how the CIA would, because the CIA is working in tandem with British intelligence. Mm. Uh, and so they are the ones who are coordinated with Tavistock to, you know, share research and so forth. Uh, and they realize that, yes, everything that, that Huxley's talking about, and that's, this is why Huxley went to Berkeley and gave his famous, famous lecture. Berkeley, hello. <laughs> right. right. This is hippie central. Um, saying that you will be, given uh, giant loads of drugs and you will be ushered into the technocracy. That's what he says in the lecture. And he says, he even says at one point, all you people in the audience are too stupid to even understand that I'm telling you that this is really going to happen. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was right. <laughs> I mean, most of, most of the people in the West have no idea what's happening to them. And he's also yeah. not a good guy warning us. This is another no, mistake. No. A, lot, a, lot of, a lot of people make a mistake and they say, oh, but I but see, uh, uh, I, I, when I read Alice Huxley, he talks about uh, freedom and, and he doesn't want us to be enslaved. That's because he's a liar. <laughs> That's because he <laughs> also wrote elsewhere that he believed in this plan. Yeah. So <clears throat> how did this impact uh, this shift to deindustrialize and the hippie movement and all this? How did this impact Christianity in the West after the hippies started to rise up? Uh, I heard you talking about this recently. I was wondering if you could give us a little insight here. Well, you have the co-opting of the church, basically. Yeah. And even though this Habermas talk that I did last night was for subscribers, it was actually illustrative in one part where he talks about the churches being made Marxist. Now, let's put this in context because... In a sense, they were, and in a sense, they weren't. If you mean by Marxist, the Frankfurt School Marxists and the cultural degradation, cultural Marxism, yeah, yeah, they have been turned to that. But how was that done? Was it done by a bunch of dirty dudes uh, on the streets of hate Ashbury with Che Guevara T-shirts and uh, wearing a, a, a beret? No, it was done by giant <laughs> hordes of money. Uh, behind the the uh, Frankfurt School, as one example. It was done with giant amounts of money put into studying the effects of LSD by the military, by the CIA, by psychiatric institutions. Uh, it was done by um, the promotion of the degenerate uh, rock bands, right? So this changed the culture, and because American Christianity, <coughs> excuse me, American, American Christianity from the beginning, uh, I would say, has been very troubled and uh, kind of on a double think dilemma because uh, of the weaknesses, I would say, in the founding ideology of America. Mm. There's always been a, a susceptibility in American Christianity to, instead of informing the culture, to mirror the culture. So it should be the other way around. But, you know, this is why your, your preachers in America end up looking like CEOs. They be begin acting right. like CEOs and their churches look like giant uh, strip malls or factories <laughs> and that's the uh, the heresy of americanism absolutely yeah yeah so I, I think wim hof is correct that the the cia through the facade of the cold war i'm not i'm not saying there weren't real persecutions during the cold war in fact this actually duped a lot of the russian immigrants the white russians that left russia it was British intelligence and people in the West that that brought them over, uh, and but but I don't think that they understood that the long term game was not that the people in the West were their friends. The long term game was to ultimately uh, support the dismantling of Russia and the institution of the New World Order. Uh, and the, the CIA did a similar tactic with the Catholic Church by getting the Catholic Church to jump on board the CIA's doctrinal warfare program uh, of C.D. Jackson and other uh, characters like that, Henry Luce, uh, and that this 
ended up being part of the reason why Vatican II happened, and you had the passing of uh, the acceptance of Dignitatis Humanae and Nostra Aetate. Hmm. And just for the listeners out there, not all my listeners are Catholic, but most of them are. Uh, Jay is not Catholic; he's Orthodox. So just just so you're aware of that, and um, you know, we don't have to agree on every single thing, but look into these things because there definitely has been deep state influence on the Catholic Church. There's no denying that. Well, well, David Wimhoff is a practicing. Catholic, as I understand, and, and he does accept Vatican II, so I'm not, I'm just using him as an objective Catholic source who, sure. who as a lawyer in this giant, you know, thousand source page book, <laughs> um, you know, he, he argues, I would say definitively, and it, it actually makes a lot of sense with all the other research that isn't Catholic. You know, I mean, Dave McGowan is not Catholic, but his, or was not Catholic, he's passed away, but you know, his book was not focused on religion, but it kind of came to the same conclusions that you had the deep state basically interested in trying to co-opt large religious institutions. And you, you will find that this is very common. They, and, and just think about it from the, the, the deep state perspective. Wouldn't you want to use the engine of something like Catholicism for uh, your yeah. purpose? Yeah, I mean, Brzezinski in um, Between Two Ages, uh, he says the, uh, in the first few chapters of the book that the that America and Americanism has to capture and use these big institutions like the Catholic Church. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and this is probably the most conspiratorial uh, type interview that I've done on this show. Um, I've said often, though, that I believe the people who are in control of our civilization right now are very evil, and this is just opening up the, the uh, Pandora's box to look at the kind of evil that they're doing. Uh, these people are diabolical geniuses, and this is the war between good and evil, which is why it's so important for Christians to stay uh, in prayer to study philosophy and good, solid theology and to not be taken in by this stuff. Because when you fully grasp the amount of conditioning that you've been put through in your life growing up in the second half of the 20th century and the 21st century, it's uh, you have to go back to first principles and reevaluate all your assumptions about the world. So um, and that's a little closing thought, I guess. Well, w one other thing I would say to Catholics and I what formerly was Catholic is that there are plenty of Catholic books that, that will vindicate what I'm saying. The most e uh, obvious of, of which are the papal encyclicals uh, of the last couple centuries. And I'm not saying read all of them, but uh, if anybody does want to delve into that, you can, I would recommend a couple things. I would say read first and foremost, uh, Leo the 13th encyclical, uh, humanum Janus on Freemasonry. Hmm. Then I would say read uh, the Tan books, uh, the Tan publisher book, The Popes Against the Modern Errors. Uh, and then and then if you read those two things, you'll see that, you know, this is not a uh, crackpot conspiracy theory, but something that the papacy has been talking about for a long time. In fact, Absolutely. there's a whole there's a whole slew of uh, anti-Masonic uh, papal encyclicals. Yeah, that honestly, uh, that kind of thing was really what got me interested in, in Catholicism, was seeing how the popes and the church were really at odds with this evil agenda in early in the 20th century. And I'm sad to say that it's lost a lot of ground in the second half, but um, anyway, that those encyclicals are definitely eye-opening, to be sure. We need to do right. a show on Freemasonry sometime and their battle with the Catholic Church. That would be interesting. Yeah, it would be. Um, I, I would. Uh, I've also been reading uh, a cult Renaissance Church of Rome, which is a critique of the Renaissance era papacy by Michael Hoffman. And I think he makes a very compelling case. I think he's very weak when he tries to explain the first millennium of the church, but I think for the second millennium of the church, he also makes a very interesting case that it's not like everything was rosy you know, prior to the French Revolution. Right. Uh, it, there was a, a lot of the same kinds of hermetic, uh, Gnostic, Platonic, and Kabbalistic influence prior to, uh, the, you know, the modern Enlightenment period as well. Yeah. And I was saying on the last show that this kind of worldview we've been talking about is a sort of form of Gnosticism. And... Really, Gnosticism has been around since the first century of the church. It's waxed and waned in its influence and presence, but 
really, when you start to think that you can use your willpower and technology to override the laws of God and the natural law he's written into reality, that is a form of Gnosticism, trying to escape physical reality. And Anyway, so that would be my yeah, thought on it. I would totally agree, and I was just having a discussion with some people today about this. We were kind of arguing about the question of uh, race, ethnicity, gender, these kinds of things. And w- when you believe in the goodness of God as a creator, which Gnostics don't, mm. when you do believe that God is a good creator, you suddenly don't have as much of a problem <laughs> with there being other ethnicities, other races, and different right. genders. That real diversity is not an issue for you. You're not worried about it. And and uh, for Orthodox, uh, you know, we have our tradition of uh, iconography being done a certain way always you, you can't you can't like make up some kind of new way to do icons and that's because we believe that they uh, don't just show us a window into heaven but but I- iconography also confirms the veracity and truth of history so if there's a saint like saint moses the black who was a famous black man who's mm-hmm. a saint uh, you know, he and his icon, he's going to retain his physical characteristics and his race and his gender. And, you know, in the, in the book of Revelation, when, when John sees, uh, into heaven, when he sees the, the, the eternal state, he says he sees every race, tribe, tongue, and ethnicity present. Uh, and that's because, of course, Christ died for all. There's no right. question about that. But Christ dying for all does not mean that he wipes out people's history and ethnicity any more than it means he wipes out gender. So that's why it's very important for us that you don't, you know, you know, Jesus, think about Jesus when he's resurrected. He doesn't become pan, you know, pan gender, pan racial Jesus. He becomes a, a no longer subject to, to, uh, to death. Well, technically speaking, he wasn't subject to death, but he willingly underwent death. You know sure, what I'm saying? Sure, sure. In his resurrected state, it's still the same Jesus because he has the hole in his side. Thomas puts his fingers in. Right. And he says, you know, uh, uh, he says that we will be like him. We'll have the same type of resurrection, which does not negate our historical existence and who we were. Sure. So if you're a black Christian, you die and you're resurrected, you're going to still be a black resurrected Christian. Right. Absolutely. There's no, yeah. There's. I mean, this is the thing about Babel and and the, the New World Order, globalism, transhumanism. It is Babel. You know, they say we want to make a tower to heaven in our own name, right? And that's contrasted with Abraham, who builds an altar to the Lord and calls on the name of the Lord. Right. So Abraham's religion is based around theology and faith first. And Babel, worldly religion, the city of man, as Augustine called it, is based around the idea of man will be God. Uh, and that's what transhumanism is. It's just a re- repeating of that. Uh, and Babel is still manifesting today in globalism. Mm-hmm. Babel is the idea of wrecking all the different cultures and nations and tribes into one giant blob uh, run by Skynet. Yeah. And that is what's going on in Europe with the Muslim invasion and the United States right. and even in yeah. China. They're trying to do this in every country that has a, a national monoculture. They're trying to turn it into the uh, New World Order corporatist gray glob. So Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. All right. Well, Jay Dyer, thanks for coming on. That was a great chat. I um, hope to have you back soon to talk about some more theological issues, if that's amenable to you. Sure. I don't any any time. All right. Well, I sure appreciate it, man. Uh, God be with you. All right. And I would add too that uh, if people are interested, my book is still available. Um, and if you would like to get a copy of it, please get it from me and not Amazon because Amazon <laughs> undercuts authors. Uh, my book is not an occult book. It is a uh, comparative religion analysis uh, of different movies and films. Uh, in 363 pages with 404 footnotes, uh, and it includes very subtle critiques of things like uh, Darwinism mm. and atheism uh, in under the, the, the guise of film analysis. 
Yeah, so I'm kind of still kind of new at the podcast game, so I forgot the plug section. Uh, I also wanted to say, if you go into Podcast Addict and search Jay Dyer, you'll get Jay's analysis RSS feed on there and get all his great content. Uh, he's been putting out some awesome stuff lately. Uh, maybe you have another method they can find that feed as well. Uh, it should be on all the major feeds like that. Um, okay. It's on Spreaker and it's on iTunes and uh, you know, you can always go to YouTube. The same, the uh, my my stuff goes out to all those areas. Good deal. All right, man. Well, uh, thanks again, and you have a good evening. All right, thank you. <laughs>